Hey kiddos, it is Tuesday night, St. Patrick's Day, and I have been sheltered in place, sort of, for a little bit. Chapman and Cheney are home, and my husband is working from home, and we didn't have a modem. Our modem broke over the weekend, and so we have been struggling with Wi-Fi, but the UPS truck delivery driver delivered it for us today and so we're very excited not so much because of schoolwork we can now we can watch netflix and other things that we were not allowed to watch where's cheney so anyway um i am going to attempt to go through my lesson um with you i'm going to send you the powerpoint tonight and then uh if you can open it up tomorrow sometime and watch this video as you are, as I'm talking, you can kind of follow with me and I'll have some um, assignments and whatnot. So anyway, I've got my computer PowerPoint Woo. Uh, right here. I'm going to probably take a seat here. Hopefully you'll still be able to see me. Yes, you can, sweet. All right, um, so we are gonna do what we did with the discussion related to um, the end of the Plains Indians War and the end of uh, the Wild West and those things and do sort of Mrs. Campbell's crash course history. And so today we're going to be talking about chapter 14 and I've got my history book right here. I'm going to open to it if I need to. I've also got my notepad and something to write with. That might be a good idea as well. I've got my readers on. These are not actually real glasses. They're just to read. So if you see me doing this a lot, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best that I can. Just drop my pen. All right, so U.S. history. So chapter 14 talks about the industrial age. And if you wanna just click through your PowerPoint until you get to the slide that has a picture of the Reconstruction presidents and a picture of the presidents from 1881 to 1901 that we talked about, um, I guess last week now. Uh, and so we are actually gonna target a period of time that is a little bit of an overlap in the Reconstruction era and also the Industrial era feeds into that period of time from 1881 to 1901. Uh, so the things we're gonna talk about today are covered in both of those eras. Uh, the next slide has a, the same picture that I had on uh, the screen last week that has all of the presidents from Gr James Garfield through William McKinley. It's got a few pictures on the bottom that have pictures of the cowboy era, uh, the Plains Indians era, all the way to the discovery of oil, and then a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, which happens kind of sort of towards the end of the century. Uh, the next slide says New Industrial Age, Chapter 14. And you'll notice there's a picture of a oil rig exploding uh, with a picture of Texas on it and a star that says Beaumont, Texas. I'm actually gonna turn on my book to page 436. Page 436, and I, if we were in class together, I would have us read this introduction together, but I'm gonna read it if you wanna follow along with me. There's a picture on this slide of a gentleman by the name of Higgins and a gentleman by the name of Lucas, and we can thank them for uh, pushing through and um, taking a, I guess you could say, a chance, an investment. They were entrepreneurs that believed that there was oil in Texas, and boy, were they right. So I'm just gonna read this. You can follow along with me. Uh, one day, Patillo Higgins noticed bubbles in the springs around Spindletop, a hill near Beaumont in southeastern Texas. This and other signs convinced him that oil was underground. If Higgins found oil, it could serve as a fuel source around which a vibrant industrial city would develop. Higgins, who had been a mechanic and a lumber merchant, couldn't convince geologists or investors that oil was present. But he didn't give up. A magazine ad sinking inv seeking investors got one response from Captain Anthony Lucas, an experienced prospector who also believed that there was oil at Spindletop. When other investors were slow to send money, Higgins kept his faith, not only in Spindletop, but also in Lucas. Um, let's see, Captain Lucas, said Patillo Higgins, these experts come and tell you this or that can't happen because it has never happened before. You believe there is oil here, and I think you are right. I know there is oil here in greater quantities than man has ever found before. In 1900, the two men found investors and they began to drill that autumn. After months of difficult, frustrating work, on the morning of January 10th, 1901, oil gushed from their well and the Texas oil 
boom had begun and it's still going. A lot of it's going in the Gulf of Mexico today. Uh, and so the discovery of an easy way to access oil or an easier way to access oil um, is going to change the way we move, the way uh, we transport things. It's gonna change um, industry in general and it's gonna make America a powerhouse. Uh, let's see here. So if you flip to the next slide, it says expansions of industry. And specifically, this chapter deals with oil, steel, and electricity. I'm just going to read through my slides. In 1859, black gold or oil uh, was retrieved from the earth um, through Edwin Drake's invention um, of a steam engine drill. And this enabled people to get to the oil that was, of course, already there uh, in the story that we just read. Um, oil uh, it was used specifically for kerosene and one of the side effects of extracting kerosene for lamps and other things that were used back then was this derivative of gasoline it was just kind of an afterthought um, who knew that someday it would be used to um, run our cars and lots of other things and so oil was initially used for kerosene eventually they realized the gasoline uh, that was an extra, um, was going to be able to be used for other things. Uh, between 1886 and 1906, iron ore became refined steel. So um, iron obviously had been in use, um, had been for many, 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 many centuries. Uh, but <clears throat> the process of refining iron into something uh, known as steel uh, was developed during this era as well through something called the Bessemer process. Uh, what the Bessemer process does is it removes carbon uh, from the iron ore um, and it creates steel. Uh, steel towns were born all over America. Pittsburgh Steelers is probably the most familiar uh, term. The city of Pittsburgh was a steel town and they named their football team after that. Uh, this changed the way railroads ran. Farm machines were made with steel. Bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge, um, a suspension bridge were, were created. Um, uh, Brooklyn, Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge was actually created or built, finished in 1883. And also, uh, cities changed. Um, prior to the invention of steel, um, the, probably the tallest building you might find in New York City was four stories tall, three or four stories tall. Uh, now, with the, advent uh, the invention of steel, uh, this new construction material, skyscrapers popped up all over these major cities, multiple levels high. And of course, with that, they also had to invent something to get people from uh, story to story. Um, and the elevator was also invented. Um, there's a picture in your slide presentation of the Brooklyn Bridge in 18, probably 1890-ish, um, shortly after it was built. Um, I've included some pictures of my family when we visited there a few years ago. There's a picture of Chapman um, uh, at, on the river there, right underneath the, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And then the next picture actually shows Chapman and Cheney standing in the very location that that original picture was taken. Uh, and it virtually looks the same. I'm sure work has been done over the years to fine tune um, the structure of it and to make sure that it's still safe but uh, for all intents and purposes it's still it's still looking good actually I was watching the news a little while ago trying not to watch the news too much because it's so depressing uh, but happened to walk in when my husband was watching the news uh, and they were showing New York City they were showing Times Square there's nobody nobody on in Times Square uh, and then on the Brooklyn Bridge you can actually walk across the Brooklyn Bridge tourists can do that and uh, there were like four or five people crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. It was so weird because normally it's very, very uh, crazy busy. Um, the next slide talks about some other inventions of this era. And, I, and don't, we don't think that these things are really that significant, but at the time they were. 1867, Christopher Soles invented the typeset or the typewriter, uh, which changed the way communications were done. It also altered the number of women that entered the workforce. This tended to be... Um, a skill that women filled in the office pool. Um, so the typewriter was invented in 1876. Um, Alexander Graham Bell invented, um, uh, my slide doesn't look right, that doesn't sound right. It says the telegraph, but the telegraph was actually invented um, earlier than that. So I think it's probably supposed to say the telephone. I will get back with you on that. Um, in 1880, uh, Thomas Edison, with some help from some other people, um, finally figured out how to um, uh, allow electricity to pass through and maintain power within um, a light bulb. Um, he tried, they say, hundreds of different 
particles that would look to, would, to, to hold the electric current as it entered the light bulb. And finally he used some sort of cardboard um, and it worked. And so from about 1880 to 1890, suddenly electricity began to spread around our country. You can only imagine how much that changed things. Um, it changed the work day. People no longer were dependent on sunlight um, or candles, which would be a terrible working environment. Um, electric fans were used to cool things off. Uh, the printing press, home appliances, uh, the ability to have electric ice boxes to keep your food cool, last longer, electric streetcars where they could transport um, foods from one place to the other without them going bad. Uh, manufacturing plants could now be built anywhere in the country. They didn't just have to be built along um, a water source. They could be built in, in inland, inside the cities. So it just changed everything. It changed the work environment. It changed production. Production just massively multiplied, uh, just changed a whole lot of things. So electricity obviously is a huge invention of that era. Uh, the next slide talks about Andrew Carnegie. Um, sometimes it's pronounced, pro, uh, sorry, pronounced Andrew Carnegie. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was oftentimes referenced as Carnegie Hall. So I've always pronounced it Andrew Carnegie. Um, there's a video that I want you guys to watch. It's about 15 minutes long that talks about his life and importance and how uh, what his business model was and how that changed over the course of time. Uh, in his retirement years, he was a phenomenal entrepreneur, which means that he uh, contributed all kinds of money and resources. In fact, he contributed everything, all of his wealth. He didn't leave any of his money for um, his family. I'm laughing because I just realized I've been looking at the wrong button the entire time. Instead of looking up here, I was looking down there. So sorry if I look cross-eyed. Um, and so on page 447 in your book, uh, it does um, tell the story of Andrew Carnegie. I am not going to read it to you, but I would I encourage you on your own independently uh, to read through that first section, chapter uh, 14, section 1, which starts on page 436 and continues through page 439. I will ask you to be responsible for that section of reading once we eventually... Um, test over this, which won't be until after spring break, uh, but chapter 14, section one, which is titled The Expansion of Industry, is one of the sections I will, ha I will ask you to be responsible for, for anything that's in it, whether I've spoken it or it's been a PowerPoint, you're responsible for that. I would also encourage you to turn over to page 447. Uh, it's called Big Business and Labor, and it talks about the movers and shakers of the business industry. Um, during this industrial era and it starts off with Andrew Carnegie or Andrew Carnegie uh, and his innovations in the Bessemer process and that sort of thing. So I would encourage you to um, uh, read that. Uh, re I would say read page 447 and 448 specifically about him and vertical and horizontal integration. Um, I'm also going to send you a link to the video that I want you to watch regarding him. It's only about 15 minutes long. Um, Andrew Carnegie got his uh, wealth in a whole bunch of different venues. Ultimately, he landed on steel, and that's where he made his fortune. Um, by the time he sold his um, his company, he was the richest man in the world. Uh, he sold his company to J.P. Morgan, and uh, J.P. Morgan was a banker, financer, and uh, his company, after purchasing uh, Andrew Carnegie Steel Company, he became the, uh, J.P. Morgan became the first billion dollar um, business owner in the world. And so, or in the country, I'm assuming in the world. Um, the next slide says a new industrial age, which coincides with chapter 14. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it coincides, the, the, actually the industrial, a new industrial age is, a t is, a ch is the title for chapter, all of chapter 14, sorry. Uh, so you'll notice that there is a picture of several uh, different uh, men of power throughout the ages in America. Um, every single one of them, uh, the people that are pictured in this are American or American businessmen. There's a picture of Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller and JP Morgan, Thomas Edison, um, Steve Jobs, um, Sam Walton, um, 
uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, a whole bunch of guys. Some of them you'll recognize, some of, the, some of them you won't. But one of the things that's discussed about in chapter 14 are whether or not these men, and at the time they were all men, um, were they considered captains of industry, which meant they represented their industry well, uh, they were the powerhouse, but it was a positive title, or were they robber barons? Were they people that used their money and their influence and hit people over the head with it and took advantage of it, um, prevented people from unionizing, were they against the workers, or were they all capitalist materialism, etc.? cetera? Um, and some of them were actually both. My daughter is now take, recording me, recording. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird to hear myself talk and look around and know that my family is walking on tiptoes, afraid to interrupt me. I'm trying to do this quickly so you're not bored out of your mind. Um, so anyway, uh, if you'll move to the next slide, there are several pictures of an area in uh, Rhode Island called Newport. And um, at, at one time, these homes were, it was known as the Million Dollar Mile, where the homes for the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers and the Morgans and um, um, the Carnegies, where they, uh, they built their beautiful homes. Not all of them had homes there, but those sorts of people bought homes there. Um, it was where the richest of the richest lived. Uh, in America, at the end of the 19th century, in the um, late 1800s, as we were moving into a new century, uh, the rich top few percentage of Americans that were benefiting from this industrial age were really a small, small percentage of the American workforce. Most people made meager livings, and we'll, we'll discover in the next chapter uh, that many of the immigrants that were coming to our country were making nothing. They were working for nothing and barely scraping by and living in terrible conditions in uh, large cities, created lots and lots of issues, lots of problems. Uh, but there was this top tier of Americans that, um, like their ancestors of old, um, during the planter era, like a pre-American Revolution or colonial era, where you had just a small percentage of the population that owned land and was profiting from whether it was slavery or industry, the textile industry. Um, the middle class has busted out since that time. But during this era, they lived pretty lush and um, um, were kind of looked down upon by the rest of society because they uh, appeared to be um, so materialistic. So some of these pictures were my pictures that I took while I was there. If you ever have a chance to go to Newport, Rhode Island, and tour some of these mansions, it's phenomenal. I don't know if you guys have read The Great Gatsby yet, um, but uh, both of the, the old movie and the new movie were filmed in some of the mansions here, but um, they're incredible, almost all of them back up against the ocean, and they have these long, huge lawns, almost football length, that lead uh, to cliffs that uh, then lead to the ocean, where they would entertain um, on during uh, cool summer nights, they would wait till the sun would set when the temperatures would go down and they would have the ocean breeze and they would have the tables set out um, and the orchestras playing um, and the women with their um, fancy dresses and the men in their tailed tuxedos and flower arrangements everywhere. Um, lots and lots of butlers and, and such. Um, there's a picture with some children playing in the backyard of one of these homes. That's actually my kids and my nieces and nephews. Um, there's a picture that shows the sprawling yard where they would entertain at night. Um, there's a picture from a distance that shows several of the houses along this million dollar mile. You, or mile, I think it's actually three miles, but you can walk it. There's trails that go by that. Most of these homes are museums now and you can tour them for a pretty small fee and if you ever have a chance when you hear the word mansion, this is what they're talking about. It's pretty incredible. Um, and then the next couple slides has the definition of what a captain of industry is and a robber baron is. I want you to read over there, over those. It defines a little bit what each of those means. But, but all of these men that were pictured, I would say some people would, probably every single one of them would fall within um, each of these categories and some of them, both of these categories. Uh, I listed a few of them uh, with the information uh, about them that cannot be found in the book, so it's important that you read over it. Corn Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, the industry that he was uh, big time in was the steamboat industry prior to the railroad, um, and then eventually the railroad industry. Um, there, are, uh, he, even to this day, some of you know, um, I can't think of his name. He's on CNN, Anderson Cooper. Uh, he is the grandson of Gloria Vanderbilt, who was the fashion designer. Um, and I, I think 
her grandfather was Cornelius Vanderbilt, but that's a whole family thing. Um, he rags to Rich's story. Um, he decided to crush the competition. Competition. He would gobble up the in steamboats in particular. Um, he would drop his prices so low that his competitors could not compete with him and they would either sell to him or go out of business and then once he owned them all he would jack the prices up and make all kinds of money from the consumer that was kind of his thing um, eventually he purchased the New York Central Railroad uh, and on and on his name that family name is still all over the place uh, in the business world and in real estate and um, finances very very wealthy family the picture there from New York City it was their home they have the biggest baddest home in New York City that home is no longer there um, it was taken down the real estate value was pretty off the chart so I don't even know what's there now uh, the Biltmore estate in North Carolina is one of the uh, says George Washington Vanderbilt the second so I think it was a great grandson of his uh, it was built I'm sorry grandson it was built between 1889 and 1895 and today it is the largest privately owned home in the United States 178,000 square feet what uh, it is a museum you can tour it if you look at the picture closely there's a line of people waiting to go in uh, I have never visited it I've had students that have toured it um, especially if they're heading over to the beach um, in North Carolina or South Carolina it's definitely worth a detour if you ever get a chance to go there there's several pictures there it looks like something out of Disney uh, it's crazy it's tucked in the mountains there um, the the lawns the gardens are phenomenal um, flip through these it's hard to believe that there's a home that looks like this uh, in the United States it looks like something right out of Europe uh, Andrew Carnegie is listed again talks about his steel industry um, most of these guys were philanthropists which means they invested their money in things they believe were important um, either during their industry or after they retired um, Carnegie in particular donated huge amounts of money to the Tuskegee Institute, um, which was an all-black college in a time where blacks were in generally suppressed. They didn't have education, they didn't have access to education like whites did. Uh, and so he poured a lot of money into that. He was an, I guess you could say, an, um, he would have been an abolitionist at heart, although he, his, most of his era was post-Civil War. Um, he also is the, um, bears the, contributed in, um, helped build Carnegie Hall, which is a um, music hall in New York City, very, very famous. In fact, our Lifeway kids got to visit there a couple summers ago and seeing some of the younger kids. Uh, and then more than anything, he contributed money to public libraries, uh, just hundreds and hundreds of libraries. Thought that was very important. So, um, and as I said before, he didn't leave any of his money to his children. Um, he gave it all away or uh, spent it all so his children had to find their own way in life. I would imagine they probably did uh, Another picture of uh, Carnegie Hall shows what it looks like on the inside. It's just gorgeous You want to see what it looks like on the inside? Can I get some water on the car? Yeah uh, There's Carnegie Hall on the inside. Isn't it pretty? Oh, yeah. Yeah looks so pretty. All right moving on uh, <laughs> uh, John D. Rockefeller uh, st owned Standard Oil Company he was also a philanthropist. Uh, he lived to be very, very old. Uh, he lived through the Civil War. He was a big supporter of Abraham Lincoln's and went on to, if you, you can see, he lived to almost World War One. I'm sorry, World War II. He lived through World War One. So he lived through the Civil War, um, the Spanish-American War, World War One, and then he died shortly before World War II. But, um, he popularized trust companies. He was the first American billionaire. He donated over $500 million to various educational, religious, and scientific causes. And one of the things I think is so funny is uh, on his resume, it says he's a Baptist. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Rockefeller Center in New York City is named after him. If you guys get to go to New York City next year, you'll get to see it. It's pretty cool. Uh, J.P. Morgan, whose name is sometimes associated with uh, Morgan Chase, a bank. He is also probably the inspiration for the Monopoly banker um, in the game Monopoly. You'll see a picture of him here, there. Um, he owned the first billion dollar company. Uh, he merged Carnegie Steel with his company, U.S. Steel Company. Um, he took over businesses, made them more profitable. He was a, he was a money man. He understood money. Um, when the United States decided to give up the U.S. Bank in any 
Federal Federal Reserve, there was a Federal Reserve at the time. Um, the U.S. government had a huge crisis, financial crisis. They actually had to borrow money from him. Um, I actually think they borrowed gold. Uh, yeah, they borrowed gold from him because they were in dire straits and they had no reserves. Um, and so he, you could say he, he bailed out the United States government. Uh, he also is the financier behind Thomas Edison's Illumination Company. So, capitalists, if they use their money well, contribute enormously uh, to the betterment of society and specifically our opportunities that we have here. Um, he is an example of that. Uh, there's a picture of him on the Monopoly. I'm thinking that he may be definitely the inspiration for that. Um, and then as you go through the slideshow, there are all kinds of different people here that are uh, captains of industry is what we're going to call them. So Sam Walton is the captain of the retail industry. Steve Jobs, the captain of the technology hardware industry. Bill Gates, the captain of the technology software company. Jeff Bezos, uh, the captain of the e-commerce industry. Mark Zuckerberg, the captain of the social media tech industry. Donald Trump, one of the captains of the real estate industry. I threw him in here because he is our president and how weird is that? But um, in his corner of the world, uh, which isn't just New York City, also Atlantic City, um, and then Las Vegas and other, I mean other places, he's expanded internationally. Um, his name is on buildings all around the world. So um, he would definitely be considered a captain of industry. Some would say he's a robber baron as well, but. Um, he definitely has um, put his mark on the uh, real estate industry. Um, and then lastly, there is a slide that says big businesses and it has the word vertical integration and horizontal integration. If you ever study the stuff, economics and uh, that sort of thing, um, one of the things they talk about is how these people become captains of industry. How do they arrive at the top of their pyramid? Um, how do they become the big man on the block? And um, some of them do it through vertical integration, and you'll see the definition here. It says, uh, a vertical integration is when a company buys out suppliers, raw materials, and transportation systems involved in its particular industry. Um, and then horizontal integration, a company gets so big that it can just simply buy out its competitors in the same industry. Um, probably all of these men have done both of these things. Um, I think it was Andrew Carnegie that um, he bought out the transportation, um, industry that transport like the, the railroads that transported goods to his steel mills to and from um, and so he was able to control his prices by doing that um, of course he had to get to a point where he had enough money to do that um, uh, some could argue that Walmart goes into third world countries or foreign countries and buys out its competitors and takes their names off the buildings and puts Walmart's name up on the building. Um, that probably happens as well. So, um, but what I'd like for you guys to do, and I will put this instructions in um, my email, um, I want you to pick um, a captain of, of an industry, and it doesn't matter what industry it is. It has to be significantly financially stable company. Um, it could be, Chris, what's the name of that, that online money? Hello? Okay, they're not listening to me. Um, something bit, I can't remember what it's called. Um, the online money that's, that's, that's not real money. Um, that it can be an athletic, um, part of the athletic industry. Uh, it can be um, gaming systems. It can be um, something within the retail, like a paper. It could be, and it's kind of boring. Um, it could be a beauty industry. It could be um, the film industry um, there's definitely some organizations that have a market on that I, uh, pixar or disney um, that kind of comes to mind um, but i want you to pick somebody within a specific industry and i want you to do a little investigation and find out a little bit about that person's story that particular person who owns that business one of the things you will find is that it's very typical in the modern era for there to be lots of owners, but I want you to zoom in on one person. Like if I were to say king of the social media um, industry, we're, we're gonna go to Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you could, or we looked at, talked about Jeff Bezos. I want you to target one person. Um, girls, I'd love for you to find some gals that are just rocking it in the um, industry today, uh, in the professional world, um, that are considered captains of their industry. It's not as common, but um, it's still there. So I know that Mark Zuckerberg was like practically a kid uh, when he started Facebook. So 
Um, these don't have to be old people. They can be young people that are cutting edge in some sort of technology. Um, and I'll give you kind of some parameters of that in my email. So that concludes my video. I can't believe it's under 30 minutes. This means that I could be doing these lessons in under 30 minutes in class when it takes 90 minutes. So mm. anyway, all right, I'm going to sign off. Mwah. Love you guys. Miss you. This is really weird. Um, but if you have any issues with the video, I hope that I will, uh, you'll let me know. Okay. Bye.